So today's conversation is why world-class transportation is a key to a competitive economy. And obviously, Nashville benefits from a competitive and diverse economy, and we believe that uh, transit it will do nothing but enhance our prosperity uh, in the future. Today's speaker series is really the first of several that we're going to host throughout the year as part of the community initiative moving forward transit solutions for our region. And I know that you've been reading about moving forward. There's been a great community response and leadership response to Community Forward. And this is just one of the speakers uh, that we will be providing over the course of the next year to, uh, to, to inform the public and inform the community. But please help me welcome James Corliss and Stephanie Lancho. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon. There we go. I knew I'd get a good Nashville response on that. Um, my name is James Corliss, as Pete said. I'm the Director of Transportation for America. First of all, thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you to Ralph and the National Chamber for hosting us here today. Um, Stephanie and I are going to do a little bit of a tag team presentation up here. We're going to be at the podium, so uh, don't mind if we go back and forth a little bit. Um, and. What we've really been asked to do, and I'm really, A, uh, very impressed with the kickoff of this Moving Forward series in this entire effort here in the national region. Uh, I understand we're on the sort of the front earlier end of this, and I hope that what we can bring to you um, it, are really some ideas, um, some thought-provoking uh, kind of stories and case studies uh, about what is happening in the world of transportation around the United States. Now, um, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and, um, you know, I, I could have started my, my, uh, my remarks by saying I'm, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help. Um, but, uh, but actually, and this won't surprise you, uh, most of the innovation and most of the really interesting dynamic things are happening in transportation, not inside the Beltway, not in Washington, D.C., uh, somewhat in state capitals, but more and more at the local level, local governments. Uh, not just big cities, actually mid-sized cities, small towns, all across the U.S. So, uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. This is our mission statement here. Uh, as Pete said, uh, we really do believe that um, a lot of the best ideas are being driven actually out of cities. Um, and not just elected leadership, although we've got some great elected leaders, but um, a, lot of, a lot of civic leadership, business leadership, um, um, advocacy leadership. And that we can't necessarily um, not have uh, state and federal investment on the scale we need, uh, but we've got to actually understand that in many ways we have to sort of uh, invert the entire paradigm to make sure that uh, local, uh, local governments, local communities, uh, metropolitan regions really drive this conversation. Uh, we have a nice uh, advisory board that uh, guides a lot of our work. Um, including the National Chamber of Commerce, who we're delighted to have, have on, on our um, steering committee. And uh, again, uh, we've been around about six years. We spent four of those six years really working with Congress, and I'll tell you a little bit of an update about what's going on in Congress, because they actually have a, a transportation bill they're debating as we speak. But we're going to spend more of our time and most of our time this afternoon really talking about uh, what is happening elsewhere across the U.S. and what we think perhaps uh, Nashville can learn from some of those examples. Um, we, for a long time, really focused a lot and tried to get the attention of um, uh, really members of Congress on the state of America's crumbling infrastructure. We, um, we've done a lot of data and research. In fact, if you go to our website, you plug in your zip code and you can find every structurally deficient bridge right near where you live. Um, there was actually a great little campaign um, by some of our, our colleagues that said, uh, big billboards that said, this bridge you're about to cross is structurally deficient. Um, and they had a couple of uh, car wrecks, uh, people bumping into each other, not wanting to drive. They put the billboard on the back of the bridge, so you didn't know until after you crossed. Uh, but this is a great little cartoon from some of our efforts. And it is true, um, frankly, that we are letting our infrastructure deteriorate, whether that's roads or bridges or sewers or water systems or airports. Um, but there is something else that's happening as well, and we can't um, 
ignore the fact that we need to fix basically the infrastructure we built in the 20th and yes, even 19th centuries. But we also need to think more about what the 21st century demands from basically an economic competitiveness perspective. And so that's what we'll talk a little bit more about today. And now I wanted Stephanie to, to introduce herself and Transit Center a little bit. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks again for having me. It's really great to be here. We're super excited about uh, the Moving Forward Initiative at Transit Center. So um, Transit Center is actually a national foundation. Um, we were launched in 2013, um, and the foundation's endowment comes from the sale of Transit Check. Um, Transit Check is a consumer product um, that allows employers and employees to take advantage of a transit um, commuter subsidy in New York and New Jersey. Um, the business was sold in 2012, and our endowment um, comes from the proceeds of that sale. So our roots are really firmly entrenched in the promotion and support of public transit. Um, as a foundation, our priorities are split into uh, two primary areas. The first is looking at the structural issues that are preventing um, innovation in our transportation infrastructure across the U.S. Um, this can be things like how transit is governed in a lot of regions. Um, and then the second is looking at human capital. This is a huge focus for us. Um, it's in, this includes helping support and really promote a culture of innovation um, at the city level, at the agency level, and particularly at the civic advocate level. Um, because these are really, as James said, the places where innovation and change happens. Um, we do this, we've actually, we're working with um, a few of your peers from Nashville in, um, in a leadership academy that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so we have two main focus areas for our work. Um, I am leading the leadership and governance work. Um, we also have work that focuses on demand and opinion that looks at changing demographics. Um, we have a program that focuses on technology. And then we also have a, a specific project that looks at um, the, at the bus network in New York City, where I'm based, um, and how to improve that 50-year-old um, outdated network. So these are your smiling um, peers. Uh, they are part of our Transportation Leadership Academies that we actually run with Transportation for America. Um, it's the flagship program of our Leadership and Governance program. And you know, we saw that there was a real need across the US um, for, for a capacity building program um, for people that may, might not be entrenched, entrenched in transit. Um, so we looked at cities all across the US um, and narrowed a pool of about 23 cities to three. Um, this was based on their applications to us, but it also, we were looking at the real ripeness of these places for transportation transformation. Um, we looked at the business community, how supportive they were of transit, we looked at the political climate, um, and we looked at the advocacy community to see how strongly they were supporting transit initiatives. Um, we also looked at things like existing transit infrastructure, existing non-motorized infrastructure, and then the likelihood of key decisions um, in the next few years. And so from this, uh, three cities were selected. So we have your, so we have our Nashville contingent, we have our Raleigh contingent, and our Indianapolis contingent. And you know, all of these places, um, and so many others actually, have are in the same place in their transit trajectories. Um, you know, and they're planning, they're thinking about transit, and they're not, they're, they're formulating ideas on, on, on where to go. And so we really felt that this, these peer cities were in a place where it would facilitate a great discussion and, a, and, and create a, a good community. So the workshops, we've had two of them so far. Um, we were in Raleigh in May and in Indianapolis, or Raleigh in March and Indianapolis in May. Um, and each academy is focusing on a range of topics. Um, you can see we've done everything from creating messages to building coalitions um, to bus route design, which is interesting for non-technical folks, um, and more complex funding issues and, and specifically study tours as well, because it's a really great way to see what kind of, what transportation can do to a place. Um, and you know, really through this effort, we're really committed to cultivating civic leadership such that they become transit advocates in their own communities um, and, and kind of, I guess, spread the gospel of transit far and wide. Okay. Um, 
I'd like talking a little bit about sort of how we got to where we are right now, both uh, really uh, as, as a country as well as a, a collection of communities that have really struggled with transportation. Um, one, of, one of my favorite lectures I did recently, I went into my son's third grade class in Washington, D.C., where I live, and we talked about the history of transportation. Of course, the coolest thing they ever saw was the flying car. I took that one out of this, uh, this, this presentation. Um, but. It, it really, the, the, the history of transportation is, is, is truly fascinating, right? If you start from the Transcontinental Railroad and the idea that basically um, uh, Congress authorized that railroad, it was in many ways the first public-private partnership you could argue for infrastructure because the way they paid for it was not just simply putting all the money down, uh, but actually giving land to every single railroad all the way down. If you look, you can still see the little towns that were built along the railroad, those were given to the railroads. Uh, that basically they could profit from that land. It was in many ways the first transit-oriented development. Um, and then fast forward another hundred years, and, and perhaps one of the next biggest policy shifts uh, was the Interstate Highway Program signed by President Eisenhower in 1956. This really is the root of a lot of our federal funding and federal policy. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a very big deal when it was passed. And Uh, those were the heady days of the construction of the interstate highway system, and in many ways, it did something very similar to the railroad, which was that it connected cities, uh, and it really transformed the economy, um, um, fundamentally so. But, it, but also, in many ways, um, while it took from 1956 to 1991 to complete the in entire 45,000-mile interstate highway system, uh, that really was... Um, sort of the, the moment in time, the four decades in time, of, of federal policy. It was funded by the gasoline tax. Uh, first of all, a couple of cents, it grew over time to about 18 cents a gallon. So whenever you fill up at the pump, you now still pay 18 cents a gallon uh, of a federal gasoline tax that goes into the federal transportation program. However, however, that 18 cents has stayed flat since 1993, imagine where you were in 1993 and what things cost in 1993, right? There would be no product out there that you would artificially set the price and not actually increase it, but that's sort of what we have done. And over time, what of course has happened is actually uh, uh, driving has actually leveled off. Vehicles have gotten more efficient. Uh, we haven't raised uh, the, the gasoline tax and actually inflation has taken hold. So the purchasing power of that gasoline tax basically conspires on that green line there uh, we actually have a separate highway trust fund, a transportation trust fund at the federal level. It is going into the red. You can see that red line down there. Congress is basically patching this together uh, every couple of months or every six months or every year now. Uh, we put another infusion of money into the trust fund to kind of keep it stable. Congress is not going to raise the gasoline tax anytime soon. One of the most unpopular uh, taxes. And uh, what's interesting that, and what's happened, and this is a little bit of the story about coming, is coming back to why cities are innovating and why cities are made mostly showing the leadership is the last federal transportation bill that passed in 2012 uh, was stable and flat funding. It almost was a severe cut in funding, but it was stable. And state governments and then state capitals all across the country, they said, uh-oh, Congress is not going to come to our rescue anymore. We have got to do something ourselves. And remarkably, more than 20 states have now increased their own state fuel taxes to pay for the state transportation needs and priorities. That is pretty remarkable. It's a remarkable show of leadership in states red and blue, Republican governors, Democratic governors. Yet what it is actually doing is doing the very same, uh, correcting for the very same trend I told you about, sort of, of a fixed tax that erodes in terms of purchasing power. So those states are passing five, eight, 10, maybe 12 cent a gallon gasoline tax increases at a state level, but they're really basically just catching up with where uh, they would have been, let's say, if that tax had been adjusted to inflation. Here's Governor Matt Mead in Wyoming uh, before he signs a 10 cent gasoline uh, tax increase. Uh, by the way, I will tell you it's a very unpopular tax. However, if you look at the numbers, uh, and we did for all the states that have passed gas tax increases the last three years, and then you go on into the primary elections for the state representatives, right? In all of those 20 states, 
98% of them won re-election in their primary. So the notion that this is actually a, a, a approving a gasoline tax increase will get you uh, booted out of office is, is simply not true. Yet it remains a very unpopular tax, which is in many ways too bad from our perspective, because it's a very fair, efficient, uh, and very transparent tax in terms of you pay for what you use. Uh, all, all that said, um, it looks like the gasoline tax is not the future of how we fund our transportation system. So we're going to turn it back over to Stephanie, and we're going to talk about now both what's happening at the local level and some disruptions that are coming. I see three major disruptions happening that are going to affect transportation in the next five years. Demographics is one, Stephanie's going to talk about. Funding and financing is another, which I just mentioned, which is that the old ways of financing and funding transportation are going to have to be replaced and rethought. And then the final one is technology. So all three of those, along with the rise of cities, both big and small, in terms of innovation and civic leadership, are actually conspiring, I think, to make this a very interesting and very important time in transportation in the US. So as James mentioned, and as you all probably already know, demographics are changing. Um, in 2014, uh, we produced a report called the Who's On Board Survey. Um, it's a 12,000 person survey of Americans' attitudes towards transit and neighborhoods um, with data from about 46 different metro areas. Um, the, the core of the report shows us who's most likely to ride transit, what would make people ride transit more, and how it interacts with attitudes towards neighborhoods, cities, and towns. Um, one of the key findings, which I'm sure, which again is not super surprising, is that the demographics are changing. Millennials are now the dominant work group in the workforce and have different preferences in lifestyle than they did, you know, several decades ago. Um, the study showed, interestingly, that people under 30 are more than twice as likely to use transit as people between the ages of 30 and 60. And those young people are about seven times as more, more likely to use transit than people over 60. Um, we found that while this is true, it's not necessarily that millennials love transit. They don't love trains or buses necessarily. They love, it's a lifestyle choice. It's about where you're living. It's about the dense urban and suburban places that transit serves best. It's about mixed use, compact and connected neighborhoods. Um, in addition to the fact that it's about lifestyle, it's also about cost. With rising cost of living, transit can reduce household expenditures, um, which is a key concern of this demographic. And further, if you control for place of residence, income, race, and other factors, age still plays a significant role in the likelihood of, of, of using transit. The younger you are, the, mo the more likely you are to ride transit. And this suggests that there really is a generational difference in lifestyle attitudes and attitudes towards transportation. Um, and the cities that are going to capture this market are cities that have these mixed-use neighborhoods that provide transit. Um, and they also are the regions that we're seeing now growing a lot. Um, another topic that we covered was barriers to transit use. So we asked people what would make them ride transit more, and we gave them the list of these 12 questions here. Um, across all of the age groups that we surveyed, people identified the same four fundamental factors um, that would cause them to ride transit more. And that was if it took less time, if the stations and stops were closer to where they live or work, if it was clearly less expensive, and if service was more reliable. These are very practical core issues um, that boil down to, does transit take me where I need to go, and can I trust it? Um, it's really not about marketing, but that's an important component. And it's also not necessarily about nice amenities, although those have other, other importance with placemaking, community placemaking, and then with economic development. But it's really about making sure that the system is providing a competitive choice for people, it's fast, efficient, and it takes them where they want to go. And, you know, this is being understood all across the country. Um, this, and especially in places you don't expect. This is um, the mayor, the former mayor of Oklahoma City. Um, he's a Republican mayor in a conservative region in a conservative state. And he understands that in order to make his city competitive, he needs to create a place where where the kid, where his kids and his grandkids are going to want to live, 
Um, and, and an important part of that equation is transit. And so finally, um, another important trend that we gleaned from the Who's On Board survey is that people really want to live in mixed-use compact neighborhoods. Um, we asked them what kind of neighborhood they live in currently, and in general, the responses showed that the preferences aren't really being met by what's on the ground. People want mixed-use, walkable neighborhoods. Um, it doesn't have to be in really dense urban settings. It can be in kind of denser um, suburban settings. Um, and particularly where they can get around without depending on an automobile, where they can you know, go to the grocery store or walk to a local cafe. The kinds of amenities that make life livable. Just as Stephanie was talking about those demographic shifts and really this um, uh, emerging uh, preference among a whole new generation of consumers, so too we find something else that's happening and changing pretty dramatically, which is um, physical location of, of businesses. And, and we call this now Moving Downtown. This is about a report that Smart with America released a couple of months ago called Core Values. Um, when we use the term downtown here, and I, and I really, I, I think this is kind of important. It is both in terms of the central cities that we see all over the U.S., but it's also the, 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 the boundary uh, between basically sort of suburbs and cities, if you have noticed this, is really beginning to change. So we have these kind of outdated notions that, you know, suburbs are bedroom communities and downtowns are where all the workers are. And that is still true to some extent. But suburbs, unto their own right, are actually now becoming places unto themselves, right? They are becoming places where uh, there, are, there are jobs, there is retail, there is economic development. We are seeing now two-way commutes. We are seeing suburb to suburb commute. But we're also seeing something, again, that goes back to what Stephanie was mentioning about preferences and demographics and what people want, which is basically a lively, interesting neighborhood with things to do and things to get to that are easy, attractive, interesting, and exciting. And this is also driving a lot of the relocation of U.S. businesses. So this is a study that Smart Growth America did, uh, released a couple of months ago, looking at corporate relocation. And what we're seeing is, across the country, is a lot of interest uh, in actually getting into more walkable, environments, more mixed-use environments, where so you don't have to get into your car to run every errand over lunchtime. Again, that could be downtown, it could be a small town center, it could be a suburban center that is uh, becoming a mixed-use center. Uh, and it certainly comes home in the region that I live in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. region, uh, which includes not just the city of the District of Columbia, but really the booming burbs of Maryland and Virginia. Uh, in our whole metropolitan area. Now, here's the CEO of the Marriott Corporation, first non-family uh, CEO, non-family member to be CEO of Marriott. They have a, co a corporate campus that's in Montgomery County, uh, very far away from uh, downtown DC, and he announces recently they're going to move. Uh, not in the next six months, but they are going to move when their lease is up, and they're going to move somewhere in the DC region, stay in this region, but the most important thing is they're going to move next to a frequent public transportation stop. And why is that? And he says, this limits the options. I think with many other things, our younger folks are more inclined to be metro accessible and more urban. This has put our region and our businesses and our recruitment folks and our economic development folks on notice, especially in a region that is bifurcated or trifurcated as we are, where we have two states in one, one city. And it really has really started a, almost a bidding war between downtown D.C., northern Virginia, and southern Maryland. Northern Virginia, if you haven't been there recently, is also urbanizing. Go to Tyson's Corner, uh, which was a little uh, four-lane intersection uh, of, of two little roads uh, about 40 years ago. And you'll see what's now happening, and not just in terms of this massive uh, um, office park, uh, and, 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 and corporate campuses, but really the beginning of its next transformation, which is really to an urban place and now almost a city unto itself. Now, Tyson's Corner just got four metro rail stops on the new extension out to Dulles Airport, and it's very happy about that. And it is listening to uh, the CEO of the Marriott Corporation here and thinking, we can get Marriott out of Maryland and over to Virginia, because we've got now more metro rail stops uh, than they ever will which leads Governor Hogan in Maryland to announce that he is not canceling the Purple Line light rail in uh, the suburbs of DC, but actually building it. And why is that? Because of the attraction of talent and businesses, just like uh, Mr. Sorensen is talking about here. Um, so this is, a, this is a trend. I'm not saying that there 
uh, we are, you know, the, the downtowns are growing and the suburbs are growing. The downtowns are, though, coming back and suburban centers are coming back and becoming more walkable and more urban to attract um, uh, a, new, a new demographic. And interestingly, if we looked at all these in this study, the corporate, the companies that relocated, and this is a, these are neat little websites that you can go on again and plug in your address and it, it will give you a walk score, how walkable is your neighborhood, how, a transit score, and a bike score. We aggregated every single company that moved and we looked at before and after. Uh, they're moving to more walkable, more transit accessible, and more bikeable locations. Again, those could be downtown or it could be actually uh, in, in, um, in sort of some of the hotter suburbs that are popping up. And, and, but actually showing these characteristics and these traits. So this is a really big deal. We've treated this as if it's an amenity, you know? Well, it'd be nice to have a bike path if we, uh, if we ever had one or a transit stop, but this now, for many places, is becoming a necessity. Keep going backwards. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, about leadership and innovation. Um, again, uh, because I think if we looked at, and back to my kind of history lesson that um, you're glad I didn't get too far deep in the weeds with you on, uh, but there have been these incredible sort of eras of transportation in the U.S. history. There was the era of the railroads that built, that built towns and connected the, uh, uh, the U.S. in the 1800s. Uh, there was the rise of the cities and the streetcars that actually gave rise to the first suburbs were streetcar suburbs. There was the era that I mentioned between 56 and 1991 when we built the interstates and suburbanized. Uh, there's been an era from 1991 to kind of the mid-2000s or about now, uh, frankly, where um, a lot of stuff has been happening, uh, a, a bit of status quo, and demographics have slowly changed. And I think now we are entering the next era of transportation and, 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 uh, and technology with a lot of question marks. Uh, but the mayor of St. Paul, Norm Coleman, um, knows exactly what he wants to do to basically bring his city back, and he's got a five-point plan. And I would tell you, I think this five-point plan is a pretty darn good plan that most cities across the U.S. are beginning to follow. Uh, and, and, and here it is. Uh, it's public transportation, trails, talent, technology, startups, being an incubator, being welcoming to new startups and, and, and e-commerce companies. And I wanted to change the last bullet point, traction. What he means by traction is basically making it easy for businesses to do business, um, making it easy for people to come in and have ideas about redeveloping uh, vacant warehouses and turning them into uh, residential, to build affordable housing along transit lines, etc. But he calls us the five T's. Uh, St. Paul is in some ways the struggling uh, uh, cousin of Minneapolis, if you know the, the, the Twin Cities region. And this is his plan and has been for some time uh, to get St. Paul back uh, and becoming a competitive city once again. Uh, one thing I, I should mention, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the, the, the details now on, on public transportation. Uh, we often, and I'm a, believe me, I'm a recovering transportation planner, okay? So it's, it's like at least a 12-step process uh, to, be, to become something other than a transportation planner. And we like to talk about things like headways, and we like to talk about uh, uh, all kinds of plans that you create. And these are really important things. We like to call, talk about the difference between bus and rail. Is it a bus rapid transit? Is it, is it rail? Um, we like to talk about densities and everything else. But at the end of the day, what we ought to be talking about, bottom line, is really about creating economic value and economic competitiveness. And when you look at investments in mass transit, speaking of the Twin Cities, um, the, actually the business community in Minneapolis, St. Paul, commissioned a study looking at exactly what the Twin Cities could bring in in terms of, uh, in terms of dollars, in terms of jobs. Uh, and that study actually catapulted them on the path to building out a pretty robust public transit system. I will make the point, if I haven't made it already, uh, as, as I do all the, every time I speak, uh, that when we think of public transportation, we typically think of these old legacy systems, right? We think of the New York City subway of Boston and Chicago and San Francisco. And most people, and it's true, actually, that New York City has probably uh, one quarter to one third of all the transit ridership in the US. It's remarkable. It's anomalous. Um, but it is also true that more cities than ever before are trying to think about how they can build out both a public uh, a transportation system in general, but a public transportation system in particular that scale to the size of their city, that will be successful, that are not those kinds of big metropolitan regions. And this is a map that basically just shows you simply how many of those kind of uh, projects are on the books uh, by location. 
Um, you know, the, the, the different colors mean different population sizes. And as you can tell, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, give you a little bit of a, of a U.S. tour uh, in, in the forthcoming slides here, it is not simply the big cities, but it is a lot of the mid-sized cities in particular, just like Nashville. I will also tell you, I don't have slides to show, but I will also tell you that we fundamentally believe that with, Stephanie mentioned the sort of millennial preference for moving to big cities. Um, my, my niece just moved to Washington, D.C. to go to GW University. Uh, her parents are shocked, they have sticker shock at how much GW University is costing them to send their daughter to school there. Why did she choose to GW? She got into really good schools all across the country because it was in the heart of a downtown that she wants to be in. Honestly, that's why she chose it. Now, there's a sense, and I'd love to get some Q&A and debate on this, that once millennials, you know, marry, have a family, they'll move back to the suburbs, right? And that, that may well be true. We believe, actually, the race is now on for mid-sized cities, affordable cities, to keep their affordability and their quality of life and attract these folks that when they do have families, or when they're tired of Chicago and paying $3,000 a month for rent, you're going to attract this next generation of people. And it's those same places that are building out world-class transit systems. I want to show um, a, a little bit of a comparison here and get into some numbers on some potentially, uh, perhaps, peer cities. I believe um, some of you have visited Salt Lake recently. Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend you go to Salt Lake City and understand their story and what um, uh, the journey they've been on building a public transportation system. Um, Stephanie mentioned we're working very closely with Indianapolis and Raleigh-Durham, but I've, I've put some other cities there in the mix. And again, with, as with a lot of numbers, um, uh, these are going to tell certain stories, and some of which will seem conflicting. I will try to pull out, I think, what the most important points are. Relative size of the city population within city-county boundaries on the uh, far left column, the metropolitan population in the middle there, so you get a sense of size and scale, and then the last 12 months of job growth, okay? So we know this for a fact, you're doing really well, all right? But last time I came to Nashville, my cabbie said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Nashville. This is in Washington, D.C., and he said, you and everybody else. And why did my D.C. cabbie actually know that other than watching the reality TV show? You're the it city. People know this now. Congratulations. You have a big challenge on your hands, right? Which is to actually take that it city and make it into long-term competitiveness, attractiveness, and quality of life, an affordable place to live, to attract businesses, and to raise a family for your children and grandchildren. I would suggest that perhaps is what is important. Uh, so you're doing great. Salt Lake City, doing really well. 4.4% um, uh, job growth last year. Uh, you're, you're in the top two there, okay? Let's look a little bit at transit. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the only recipe to your success in the future is to build public transportation, right? I'm a transportation wonk and a true believer, but I'm not going to tell you that. Just like Mayor Coleman in St. Paul, he's got five T's. There's lots of other T's out there that you have to kind of concentrate on, including education. I will tell you, though, transportation is more important than ever for the competitiveness of mid-sized cities. So here's a little bit of how this, how this ranks and scales. These are numbers that we pull. Transit ridership, you probably know this. You've got one of the lowest transit riderships of any of these cities. Uh, if you look at a place like Salt Lake City, you look at a place like Minneapolis, uh, or even Atlanta, we think of Atlanta as, I've been told by some people anyway, quietly, it's the place you don't want to emulate, right? It's the, there's some lessons learned from Atlanta about what happened there, and I think that's true. Um, they've actually got a remarkable metro rail system in Atlanta that pulls a lot of riders. People think nobody rides transit in Atlanta. They do. So much so that companies are now actually moving on to MARTA stations. Uh, your transit score, I'm afraid, uh, so far, and I'm not trying to make you depressed or anything, but you didn't rank on the transit score yet, okay? So you're not, you're not on the map yet, but I know you will be soon. But look at where Salt Lake City is. Look where Minneapolis is. Um, those are the, these are the kinds of, of metrics. Now, look at something else that's pretty interesting. I said at the beginning of this that, you know, the feds and states are playing a lesser role. They're still playing an important role. We cannot give up on Congress for investing. We cannot give up on states to invest in multimodal transportation. Salt Lake City is benefiting from the state of Utah uh, having a pretty uh, ambitious uh, 
uh, and very progressive 21st vision for transportation, investing big time into their transit system, as they do across the state, by the way. This is not about big city versus small towns. Uh, Minneapolis benefits from a state program that invests a lot in multimodal transportation. So the states are key parts of this. Uh, the locals drive it. Salt Lake City, again, uh, you may know this story. Uh, it is a remarkable one. I will tell you that Salt Lake and uh, the, the metro region started, as did Denver, with a big failure. Many places actually fail multiple times when they either go to the ballot or they try to get an idea advanced around public transportation because it's a pretty big sea change. It's a pretty big change in the way that you do business. So uh, we failed at least here once in Salt Lake City uh, but the second or third time they succeeded and once the public saw what this whole transportation vision was all about, they succeeded again and again and again. And now this is one of the most successful, uh, uh, I think, metropolitan regions in the country uh, for building out a public transit system. Uh, they have one of the most successful economies in the country that's truly a global economy. And they went from zero to 136 miles of rail transit uh, in just about 13 years. Uh, Denver, you're going to hear a lot about Denver. Um, Stephanie will mention it. Uh, a very interesting, an, a, another region that basically um, started with a couple of failures, but then figured out how to win at the ballot box and went forward and went forward big. Um, I will point out, I'm going to show you a couple of slides now on the right hand side there in the chart. Those, uh, the dark blue bar at the very top, this is how they funded one of their lines, the line to the airport called the Eagle. The Denver Eagle is going to open, I think, next year. So you'll be able to get off the DIA and ride right downtown. It's actually a, a, a private uh, enterprise, a, a P3. But it was built, uh, even though it's a P3 public-private partnership, it was built with both a mix of private capital, public grants, federal grants, and loans. Uh, creativity, just like it would be to build an office building or residential development, is the name of the game these days in transportation. We don't get all our money from one source. The feds are still important by the blue bars there on the right-hand side. Uh, private equity is increasingly coming off the sidelines to invest in these projects, uh, and that is important. And Denver has made really good use of public-private partnerships. Um, I know Los Angeles is a major, massive metro region that even when I lived in California, we said we don't want to be like them. But Los Angeles is trying to transform itself into the city of the car to the city of public transportation. It is remarkable what the city of LA is trying to do. And not just that. Uh, but again, look on the right-hand side there on the, on the bar. They have a loan, a federal loan called a Tithia loan from the federal government. That's a pretty relatively new program. Um, and then um, all the way down on the green side there, they have a sales tax measure, okay? Increasingly, and, and those two are related. Because increasingly, the cities that actually have local money that they have, uh, often sales tax but not exclusively, are able to pull down more competitive federal loans and grants. So the cities that help themselves do better with state and federal funding. Indianapolis, a fabulous story. Indianapolis Mayor Greg Ballard here, certainly one of, one of my heroes, uh, former Marine, uh, not a politician, came into office as the mayor of the city. And he said to his state legislature, look, I will never be Chicago. I'm not going to try to become a Chicago. But I want to be the place that when young families who leave Indiana want to leave Chicago because it's too expensive, I want to be the place they come back to. Okay? We have a trade de deficit in Indiana. Here's the trade deficit. We produce the most number of graduate degrees of any state in the country. We have the lowest number of residents with graduate degrees. I want to narrow that trade deficit. How am I going to do that? I'm going to build a world-class public transportation system. I can't afford rail. I'm not going to build rail. I'm going to build bus rapid. I'm going to make buses work like trains. And we're going to do it cheap and quick. Uh, but I've got to go to the voters, and I've got to get taxing authority to go to the voters. It took him three years to get his legislation to allow him to do that. And likely now, next November, they will go to the voters. Uh, public transportation in general, this chart just kind of shows you. It, as I said, it's a mix of funding. Federal is important. State is important. Uh, operating fares, the stuff you pay, the fare box is important, but increasingly that local share at the very bottom there, that's what's been growing, that's what's been driving a resurgence in the construction of public transit. Go to the ballot box, uh, a big story there. Uh, uh, those measures, despite what I said about those first kind of failures sometimes uh, going out, they are increasingly and approved by large margins. Um, 
there is something versus, say, Congress raising the gasoline tax about going to a local ballot with, uh, in your city or county and basically saying to the voters, here's what we will build if you actually raise taxes. Again, it's hard the first time, but once people see there's accountability, you said you, you did what you said you would do, the renewals on those measures are very successful. And finally, just a sense of um, the different ways those local ballot measures get funded. Uh, it is often sales tax in the blue uh, wedge there, but it's sometimes property tax, sometimes bonds, sometimes vehicle fees. Um, and you can see in terms of the, the, the success rates. So that's my quick kind of run through a couple of other places and cities and metro regions. Um, Transit Center had just released a great uh, new report, and Stephanie's going to walk through a couple of stories from that as well. So from data to stories. Um, so as James mentioned, we just released a report called The People's History of Recent Transportation Innovation. The report features about six cities, um, Denver, Charlotte, New York, Portland, Oregon, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and looks at the recent transportation innovations that have happened there. Um, the report finds that there are three primary actors in any kind of urban transportation innovation. Um, they are the um, civic leadership, city leadership, and agency leadership. But the, the key, the most critical piece, is the civic leadership. Um, that can be the business community, a local advocacy group, or a random person off the street. And I'm going to tell some stories about cities profile. So, while the case studies do show that civic action is the catalyst to any meaningful change, um, it does recognize that there needs to be a collaboration and communication between all of the three actors that you see here. Um, the diagram shows the relationship between the three actors and how we perceived um, the change happening. So the largest yellow circle represents the civic sector, and as I mentioned, it has been in the case studies that we looked at, it was the, the catalyst to any kind of meaningful change. Um, in each of these places, civic advocates made real critical contributions to the overall vision of what transit should be and offered compelling evidence about why. Um, and not only were their contributions very important, they were, they were essential. It might not have happened without them. And then second, the bold city leadership puts legs on the ideas presented by the civic leaders. Um, it makes them a policy or even financial priority for the city or region. And it can help frame transit in a wider context. Um, it can be part of a larger strategic vision about economic development, resilience, or public health. And then finally, if change is actually going to be implemented and long-lasting, it takes reform-minded people at the agency level. Um, they need to be on board with all of this, or they need to have strong board members to push it through. Um, they can actually commit to implementation because they are the implementers. <laughs> so, on to some stories. Um, a lot of people have heard a lot about Denver recently. Um, it's been highlighted in a lot of kind of transportation stories about its success, but before its current success, it actually failed. Um, as James mentioned, they went through a pretty uh, disastrous failure at the ballot box. Um, but after the defeat, the community kind of doubled back, and the business community in particular actually took the lead on kind of um, reinvigorating the community. Um, they did three core things that kind of picked up the pace. Um, the first, they actually worked with the region, the different mayors in the Denver metro area, to bring them together in what they call the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Um, Denver is a largely suburban city um, where a lot of people come from outside the Denver city jurisdiction into, um, into the city proper for, for work. Um, and therefore, any kind of transportation system um, depends on both for ridership and for actual political support from these other exurban areas. Um, the Mayor's Caucus brought together the region's mayors um, to discuss and develop consensus on, on issues. Um, they didn't, they're not a formal group. They are, they're, their opinions are not official in any way, but just bringing them together, promoting conversation, actually presented a united front to the community, which made the community more supportive of these initiatives. Um, secondly, the business community prioritized the support of formalized transit advocacy. 
um, the downtown bid in the chamber, along with several other um, important local business voices, created a nonprofit called the Transit Alliance, which you actually have, you have the Transit Alliance in Middle Tennessee. Um, this, this group, and it still does, it, it really helped build the support for transit. Um, it led the way for the ballot initiative to pass eventually, and it, it did before the ballot initiative passed, and then continues to do um, trainings for political and community leaders. Um, it helps them understand more technical transit issues and the co-benefits of transit, and really builds capacity and leadership, and creates a peer network. Um, which is very important. And the, this organized voice, voice in general has been incredibly successful in Denver. Um, almost every city council person has been through the Transit Alliance training program. Um, they're very well known in the city and really looked to as a resource. Um, and then finally, the business community helped to rebuild trust in the transit agency. Um, it seems kind of strange, but after the ballot initiative, um, there was widespread mistrust of the transit agency. People felt that they were very misled. Um, and they also were seen as not being very strategic and not having a vision. Um, and so what the business community did is they worked with the transit agency leadership to actually get the right people on the board who would really aid in strategic decision making, help in bettering external communication, which was a problem, um, and, and, and promote a better vision. Um, so those are the, the, the key things that the business community did, particularly in Denver. Um, and this actually led to a big victory in 2004, as James mentioned, where the voters approved seven new rail lines um, via the fast tracks ballot measure. And what's interesting about Denver is that, you know, while the business community really took the charge, they actually empowered all of the, these other sectors. Um, they, they created new leaders and political officials, they created new leaders in the advocacy community, and they created um, better leadership in the transit agency itself. And in fact, they have continued to support transit and the vision in Denver even today, as they're, you know, they're still building out their transit system and they're still implementing the vision. So next we have Charlotte. Um, Charlotte's transformation reforms began in a similar way to Denver um, with business-backed civic leadership. Um, the business community there really wanted Charlotte to feel more like a headquarters city. Um, Bank of America had relocated there in the mid-90s, and, and it didn't really have any of the infrastructure or support that some of the other headquarters cities had, like New York and Chicago, and Bank of America really wanted to attract that talent. Um, so, unlike in Denver where the city really had a vision for what transit could be, um, the transportation investments that you see in Charlotte are actually very business-led. Um, the Lynx light rail feasibility study was funded by a collection of um, corporations in Charlotte, and the multimodal hub in Center City was a public-private partnership with Bank of America. So, you know, while Charlotte hasn't seen the same kinds of coordination, and it's actually growing um, today, but um, it's still an example of this really civic-backed um, change. So, finally, I know people are around the country are, are somewhat tired of hearing about Portland, but it's an interesting story. Um, it's a little bit of a contrast to both Charlotte and Denver, so I thought it was worth sharing. Um, you know, despite Portland's very progressive reputation now, it actually um, was like any other post-industrial city in the 60s and 70s. Um, Mid-century, Portland adopted cars as every other city did. Um, it just meant streetcar, it pulled money out of its transit system, um, and, you know, it, it regarded the urban renewal process that happened all over the country in the 60s um, as the path to modernization. The state and city were really promoting suburban development, highway-focused transportation, and historic building demolition. So it, it, it wasn't the progressive enclave that we all think and see in Portland is now. But a group of residents in Portland, random people, um, who actually had been kind of national protesters. They had been very active in the Vietnam War protests, civil rights, women's movement. Um, you know, they, they came back to Portland, they saw this happening, and they said no. They said, this isn't the way that we want our city to be. We want our city, you know, again, this is the theme. This is a, we want a place where our kids and grandkids want to stay. Um, and so they, they, they started working, they started organizing themselves. Um, they, they 
they centered around the issues of highway, um, the highway investments and then also the downtown, re downtown revitalization efforts. So they really started organizing around those two issues. Um, eventually, some of them got on the city council, um, so they had allies within the city, city government. Um, and, and, and the momentum built a lot, and eventually um, they succeeded. They succeeded in preventing the highway construction, and they did push money from, from that effort into downtown revitalization. Um, and that effort, th that initiative on the part of just a few residents, um, actually set the culture that we see today in Portland, which is a culture of cooperation between citizens and government, um, and this collective vision that Portlanders have for what they want their city to either stay or what they want their city to become. So it's just a, you know, it's, it's, it, it, ha it wasn't a business-backed um, change, but, you know, it, it just kind of shows you how a few people can really lead the charge. Um, and, you know, all of these cities are really great examples about how civic leadership how critical it is um, in a lot of these transformations. And you know, it's really great, I think as Jane said, it's really great for us to see the beginnings of that here in Nashville. And I guess, you know, we look forward to seeing and working with you all and having it move forward. It sounded like the end, it almost is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I will say also, I was up in Portland when I lived in California doing a site visit for our board members, our, our elected officials, and I was, we were going around looking for spaces and uh, places to meet the elected officials in Portland, and a young woman there, about 18 or 19, said, what, what are you doing? I said, oh, we're, we're working on transportation, public oh, yeah, I tell you, this, the fact of all this transit in Portland basically means I don't have to buy a vehicle, and I am basically, I am helping pay for my college education. I don't have that kind of expense. And that, I also, believe me, I make fun of Portland, and I ask Portland, it's the, it's the left coast. Uh, but they've done something special, and I actually fundamentally agree with Stephanie, that uh, it actually is, it feels like a Midwestern city, and I think it was like a lot of struggling cities back in the 60s and 70s. Um, just want to end on a few other notes. Um, I'm gonna run through these fairly quickly. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, obviously, um, uh, back to the East Coast now. Uh, looked at building a bus rapid transit system. Back again to the notion that we can actually, the technology itself is not as important as what it can do. Uh, making buses work uh, like trains, um, uh, and this is a, a dedicated lanes for a, for, a, for a BRT system down Euclid Avenue. And the other thing, back to economic development and, and pulling in um, and becoming more prosperous, uh, these are all the projects uh, Tremendous that they're popping up along this bus rapid transit corridor. Again, using bus, but with dedicated lanes, there is something about basically signaling to people, the population, um, and, and civic leaders that that is a that is a long-term investment. We're not going to pull this out anytime soon, and, and both both tra rail tracks and BRT dedicated right of way can do that. We don't want to leave you with just the notion that you've got to put lots of public transportation, buses and trains everywhere. Uh, you certainly have to be thoughtful at where you do that and how you do it. But frankly, the streetscape and things like um, uh, putting in uh, bicycle paths are really, really important. In, in fact, increasingly important. One study here out of Long Beach, California that we helped do uh, showed the, uh, not just the outcomes in terms of increased safety, uh, more biking and walking, fewer crashes, fewer accidents, lower speed, more parking, more on-street parking, uh, but again, that adds up to more local economic vitality and development. This is a fabulous project back to Indianapolis. This is the Cultural Trail. I, I, when I first heard about this, I thought, yeah, they're gonna link a couple of museums downtown, it's not gonna be much. This is a transformational project at very low cost. This is a dedicated path right-of-way that goes from their downtown out into neighborhoods, um, you can see there, just from the, uh, the overhead on the intersection, how uh, basically visible this is, a feeling both of safety and permanence, and on the crosswalk there, you can see how they sort of treated this very differently, both uh, for wheelchair users, for bicyclists, for walkers. It's a really big deal, uh, and frankly, they're just about to announce the relocation of a major company in Indiana to coming downtown. Their one demand was to open their front doors on this trail. 
So it is a, it is a transformative low-cost project, a new study basically showing property values increasing significantly, 148% since this trail opened just over a year ago. A big, big deal. And this really is the next generation of bike infrastructure. Um, dedicated uh, with the cars away from uh, the curb with, 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 with buffers in between. Um, I know, again, just like transit, sometimes these are hard to get the first couple out there, uh, but once they do and people start using them, uh, the benefits are tremendous. Um, bike share, uh, I know you have bike share here in Nashville. This is taking off big time. Uh, one, one way the technology is actually enabling, this is just the chart of the number of bike share systems in the U.S. Uh, I can't keep up with this chart. It keeps growing and growing every month. Uh, a very big deal uh, as part of your system. Back to Indianapolis, they've just launched a car sharing program, an all-electric car sharing program all over the city. Uh, this is a pretty uh, experimental effort, but that is also popping up, um, whether it's uh, Car2Go or Zipcar. Uh, this is a company out of Europe that's doing this. So, so these, these kinds of things are, are popping up. And I know that just in case you left here today and you said, well, that guy didn't show one slide of a driverless vehicle. Here's your slide of a driverless vehicle. Okay, next slide. Now, um, look, I, I, again, maybe, maybe this is a good for Q&A, but uh, this is a big deal. And I, and I, and I and a joke by, by skipping over it. It is not going to solve all of our problems, but it is a big deal we have, that we have to get ahead of actually understand. And I actually have to think of it as driverless vehicles, not just driverless cars, okay? So fleets of driverless vehicles. You've probably seen the news that Uber basically, in the long-term game plan, at least so the the, the, the press says to basically get rid of the drivers, right? So go to actually an autonomous fleet. I think this is going to be technologically possible by the end of this decade. This does not mean that you don't also need public transportation, okay? We've got to figure out how these things work together and they can. Uh, it is not the silver bullet. Unfortunately, we've looked for silver bullets in transportation for a really long time and they don't exist. But smart strategies that actually unite different modes of transportation to think about fleets of car shares, uh, et cetera, around public transit hubs is really the way to go. Okay, so what does it all mean for Nashville? Well, let's get to some Q&A. Um, I think, I think somebody was gonna uh, mention a couple of these. I mean, I think we just, you know, the demographics are changing, and every city across the U.S. is in a race for talent. Um, millennials are joining the workforce. Um, not everybody wants to live in New York or D.C. or Chicago, um, and in fact, these regions are very attractive, um, but you have to be competitive. And and like James said, businesses are moving downtown. They want to be in places that are dense, that are walkable, that are mixed use. And so these are the things that we need to prioritize. And you know, you can learn from other cities. Learn from their failures. Learn from their successes. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot that's happening in the U.S. right now. There's a lot that's happening all over the world right now. And. Um, and, and take it and don't don't repeat the mistakes that some of the other cities have done um, because they're more than willing to share their failures. I think I would just, I would just close by, by saying, um, first of all, I give, uh, my hats are off. I've been down here a number of times now. A, Stephanie's trying to the stories of the civic leadership. Uh, you all are very incredibly well positioned, I think, in this region. You've got excellent public agencies here that have done a lot of work, a lot of groundwork. Um, and, and, but that point uh, next to last about your tent must be big and diverse is really true. As again, a former uh, public agency staff person, the public agencies cannot lead this. It must be led with strong civic participation that's diverse. Uh, and we can't get caught up in things like bus versus rail. Those are important debates. Um, they, they, they really are in terms of cost, affordability, but the big vision is what's so important and the idea that this is about prosperity, competitiveness, uh, access to jobs, and the quality of life that's gonna keep your kids and grandkids here, I think is, is where this is at. I hope this has given you really good food for thought. Um, Pete, I think you're gonna give us uh, some opportunity to field some questions. Let's give James and Stephanie a hand. Thanks,